Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, this is Rachel. Can I practice sharing my screen? I hope so. This is Josh here. <laughs> and I figured I had to start the broadcast so we could communicate. Is that correct? Or... Maybe. Oop. Okay. I think when I started the broadcast, it actually started recording, so I don't know. I, th I thought it would be either Sarah or Lauren or somebody would be on here with hey us. Hey, guys, this is uh, Jeff in Alabama. I'm listed under staff as Southern District ITE. Um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Yes. And I was shocked at how well it was run, even despite all the destruction. Oh, Sravi, yeah. are you on here? So I was making down in the, the Biscuit Forest um, down south, so I, I was on that for a little bit. And it, it, I don't know if it's a combination of just like, you know, the crazy mountain drivers that just, just like fly around everything, but like everybody, it was like there was not construction. <laughs> Interesting to finally see a lot of that stuff finished. I'll be very excited to see So, yeah, that'll be a shock for me. Hello. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Let's see. Rachel. Hey Rachel. How's it going? Hey, John. I was gonna I was Good. gonna try to practice sharing my screen. I don't see yeah. a button for that. Hold on one second. I'm gonna fix that hopefully. Can I, do I have to push this, make another attendee the presenter? Or what all do I have to do? I don't have the so, coaching, coaching background. <laughs> <laughs> so I will go ahead and share, I think WSC is a sponsor for this uh, session. So initially what I'm gonna do is share the session ad, sort of, but you can talk to that, Josh, as a, you know, you can introduce the sponsor um, for the session. And then um, you would do the moderation. You you have um, authority to do everything. So you're the organizer. You can make John the presenter. You can make Rachel the presenter. Um, yes. John and Rachel. So yes. You all can, are, they, sorry, Stravia. Do they claim it or do I force it on them? I've, I have not done a go-to meeting and I didn't. There weren't many directions in the it's, email. It's best if you do it, Josh. And I'm here to help if you want me to. Um, Rachel, John, are you all going to be sharing the screen? Like both of you are going to share the screen, or just one of you is? I'm I'm going to share the screen for the whole presentation. You're going to share the screen. Okay, so okay. can I practice now and try to see if I can make Rachel the presenter real quick? Yes, please. Okay, so. Hey, uh, Saravia, real quick. This is Jeff. How you doing? Yeah, Jeff. Hey, I didn't. Hey. You know? Um. <laughs> So the broadcast has started on this session, which means that the attendees will be hearing and seeing what you're doing. Um, I don't think that it can be unstarted. Um, so I okay. uh, just wanted to give you all that heads up. They, the attendees are behind the curtain right now. So. Okay. They're still hearing us then. Okay. No worries. 
I can stop recording if that matters. That seems to be an option I have. Does that yeah. matter? Should I do that or do yeah. that? You Let's could see. you could probably do that. Um, so we've got this recording. This is the uh, multimodal in the triangle session. The sponsor is WSP. Uh, we'll hype that up some more at the end with an advertisement. We're having some technical issues at the moment, um, but uh, welcome. I uh, hope everybody's lunch was great. We'll kind of get rolling with a couple things. Uh, once again, if you can put your questions in the chats, Ravia, is that correct? I actually forgot to ask that. Does everybody have access that is a panelist to the chat, or do I need to read it that? It would be best in the questions. Okay, in the questions. Just yeah. kidding, mm -hmm. folks. If you could put your questions in the questions, that makes it even more easy and obvious. That would be fantastic. Uh, it is my understanding, I actually had a few people reach out to me yesterday that uh, PDHs are going to be sent to everybody. That was a question that came up. Sravia, can you verify that as well? It is tracked who is logging in and such, correct? And these will be sent to us? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, perfect. They will be sent to you and they'll also be uploaded to the next slide. Um, there we go. So hopefully that okay. answers all questions regarding PDHs. Uh, we have three great sessions today. I'll kind of uh, get rolling with the first one. Like I said, this is Multimodal in the Triangle, sponsored by WSP. Uh, so the first session is going, or the first segment will be on Multimodal Projects in Raleigh. Uh, Stacy Phillips and Eric Lamb will be presenting. Stacy Phillips has been with Kimley Horn uh, for 17 years now, uh, with a focus in Multimodal Design and Operations. She is the 2018 NIC Site President. Uh, serves on the TRB Traffic Signal Systems Committee and is chair of multimodal, the Multimodal Subcommittee. Uh, Eric Lamb had a very lengthy um, thing that I will kind of summarize shorter, uh, but he is the Transportation Planning Manager at the City of Raleigh. He's been at the City of Raleigh for over 20 years. Um, so he had a lot of key buzzwords like street planning, bicycles, pedestrians, uh, long range transportation plans summarized very briefly there uh, because he's also done a lot of other things. So staff liaison for the city's bicycle and pedestrian advisory commission, uh, vice chair for technical coordinating committee of Campo, uh, member of the executive committee of IT's public agency council. And you may also remember him from such roles as the immediate past president of Nick site. Uh, he has his bachelor's and master's from NC State has been married for over 25 years and has two kids in college now. So um, if you all would like to take it away and I will mute myself and disappear. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us and we will do our best to keep everybody awake after lunchtime today. So uh, I'm Eric Lamb, I am delighted to, oops, the right place, shall we? To give you a preview of the presentation. There we go. All right. That's showing up okay? Yep. Very good. So, um, uh, some of you may have seen this presentation uh, previously at the national ITE meeting. Uh, we had to cram this into a fairly small space. But today is going to be nice that we're going to be able to take some time uh, and talk through what it is to introduce a 21st century framework. Uh, uh, for transportation into an 18th century footprint. Um, uh, so again, let's see here. There we go. Again, uh, this is us. I'm happy to be joined by Stacy Phillips from Kimley Horn. Uh, we're gonna talk about three different efforts today. Uh, one is, uh, they're all in the same geographic area uh, in terms of parts of downtown. Uh, one is a project where we want, work to integrate uh, a cycle track into downtown along West and Harrington Street on the west side of downtown. Uh, the next was a planned uh, quarter plan for Blunt and Person Street that had several phases that included some lane reductions uh, and ultimately uh, two-way conversions. And then we'll talk about how, uh, as the city of Raleigh has now been pursuing uh, uh, the implementation of bus rapid transit on multiple corridors, uh, we are well into the development of the first phase of that uh, implementation with uh, New Bern Avenue to get to see uh, some of what we've been working through with that. Um, a lot of folks, I think, realize that Raleigh is a planned city. And um, we call it the Christmas plan because it was designed by Senator William Christmas. 
Um, it was land that was purchased uh, explicitly for the purpose of creating a capital uh, for North Carolina. Um, and if you're really geeky like I am, um, you'll appreciate the fact that uh, the the model for the footprint of Raleigh uh, is based upon the, the city of Philadelphia. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with the center public square and then four uh, squares, so it's very similar uh, minus the diagonals that you see in Philadelphia. But the boundaries of, of downtown are north, south, east, and west street. Uh, there's four cardinal streets uh, that emanate from the capital that were references to um, previous um, uh, seats of government uh, with respect to Fayetteville Street, Hillsborough Street, Newburn Avenue, and the long forgotten Halifax Street. Um, and I'll talk more about what the sort of the street design locations are. One of the challenges with those, most of the streets in downtown, um, everything was laid out based on, on the old surveying system for rods and chains, uh, which led to the creation of these 66 foot rights of way uh, for each of the, of the grid streets in the city. Um, each of those has a street width that's 40 feet from face to curb with face to curb. Now, those four ceremonial streets that I mentioned um, are actually on 99 foot rights of way and have a much wider street footprint. Um, but one of the challenges that we have from a programming and use standpoint is that a lot of people see different innovations that are happening in other cities um, and sometimes don't understand that we've got these sort of space limitations um, and everyone wants to put 10 pounds into a five pound bag. And so we really have to be judicious uh, and talk about what is the, the right fit for each street, what we might do on, on one side of downtown may be different than what we do on the other side of downtown based on context, neighborhood, uh, population, et cetera. Um, but it really represents a, a challenge sometimes. So I mentioned that one of the areas that we've been working on is the blunt person corridor. Uh, and this um, has long been a, one of the one-way pairs on the east side of downtown. The entire corridor is maintained by NCDOT. In fact, at one point, it was originally designated as the US-1 corridor prior to the construction of uh, Capitol Boulevard in the downtown in the 1950s. And so um, we learned a lot about everyone's kids and dogs as part of the pandemic and mine has decided that she wants to, to join me. So thank you for indulging. Um, so one of the things that when we developed our, our livable streets plan in 2003, that was the framework for revitalizing downtown that led to the creation of, of Fayetteville Street, reopening that. But one of those strategies was looking at the Blunt Person Corridor as a strategic opportunity. Blunt Person I'll feed into Wake Forest Road on the north. And you can see as one-way pairs, you're between you know, seven to 10,000 ADT. Um, and then Wake Forest Road to the north was ranging between 12,000 and 6,000, 15,000 ADT. And so, that really creates some interesting opportunities because much of the blunt person corridors that run through downtown here to four had um, very inconsistent um, lane designations. So some sections were two lanes with industry parking, some sections were three lanes. Um, so, and then as you went to the north along Wake Forest Road, that was a four lane undivided. And so part of our strategy here was we wanted to look at implementing a road diet on the north section taking four lanes undivided to three lanes and adding bike lanes. We wanted to make the lanage consistent throughout the corridor so that we would um, uh, be able to make it two uniform lanes throughout, and that would give us the opportunity to, to add in bicycle infrastructure as part of that change. And then ultimately, part of the big goal for the process is that given the, the route that this uh, runs through the center and the core of the city, we really want to do what we could to improve conditions for pedestrian safety. So this is a shot of the before. Uh, you can see uh, this is um, from one of our parking decks looking at Nash Square, uh, I'm sorry, Moore Square on the opposite um, and looking towards towards the Southeast. And you, know, you can see the lanage here as far as you had three lanes. One of the things that was uh, problematic with this layout is that these were um, very marginal lane widths. Um, in a couple of spots, they, they may have been nine feet wide. Um, but as a result, the lane utilization was really poor. And in fact, what, one of the things that would happen frequently is that you'd see about 80% of the traffic would all be in the center lane. And the outside lanes 
lane utilization was very poor. Nobody wanted to ride in skinny lanes that were next to on-street parking or sometimes buses that would be parked on the right side here. So uh, Ed Johnson used to say that I'd rather have two good lanes than three bad ones. Uh, and that's one of the things we set up to change this corridor and, and, and create two really decent lanes through here, improve the lane utilization and have no change in the level of congestion or efficiency. And so you can sort of see how that manifests itself here um, with the layout that we've got for the, the center and what we're taking it to. Uh, the corridor plan contemplates the idea of going back and adding um, uh, bump outs and landscaping. And then we're, we're considering that as part of a phase three treatment for the project. Um, and that's certainly an opportunity to look at improved landscaping, uh, green infrastructure, uh, and better pedestrian crossings. And so now you can see this is, uh, we implemented this um, uh, at the end of last year and um, did some resurfacing work in certain portions of the corridor. This is adjacent to the Moore Square uh, Magnet Middle. Uh, we ended up having to leave a buffer in this location because of uh, school pickup and drop off that happens out here with the, the school operation. Um, we maintained all the on-street parking on the, the right side of the screen, which is the west. We also did a lot to introduce uh, more modern bicycle technology as part of the project. So we started, our, this is our first use of green paint on an NCDOT maintained facility. Um, you can see we added in buffering. The facility to the right in this picture is actually the federal building. And so we had the opportunity to remove all the on-street parking on that side. They were very happy. They view on-street parking as a safety risk and said no problem with losing that. Um, and we may come back at some point and add in um, uh, bollards as part of this installation. We also introduced the first two-stage left turns uh, as part of this project. Um, so um, if you're a cyclist and you're looking to make a left turn, you leave the bike lane that's crossing the intersection, you queue up in the, in the box, and wait for the cross street to turn green. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy. All right, so back in that livable streets plan and then in the corridor study that Eric referenced, there was an idea that the next phase of this project would be to restore two way operation to these two roads. Uh, like a lot of downtowns, these roads have been converted one way to try to push traffic. And the thought was, you know, the, the communities here, the businesses really wanted to slow traffic down. One way to do that is to convert these streets to two-way. Uh, also, as part of the project, we would look at two roundabouts on the northern end of the corridor. One to sort of solve a, a traffic conundrum near the Circus Burger, and one just to help with the transition from these two roads that would then each be two-way up onto Wake Forest Road. And the idea was to retain all of those bike improvements from phase one. So what happened between that project being, being scoped and, and getting ready to go uh, and, the, and the corridor study to when we actually started design is that uh, several other things happened. So we will hear, I think, more in this session about New Bern BRT. Eric is also going to talk a bit about New Bern BRT. Uh, but that sort of came about after the corridor study was completed and changes the characteristic of Lunch Street. So in this figure to the right, the dashed green lines are the part of the scope of the blunt person project, and the dark blue lines are a lot of the BRT corridors. So what you can see is a pretty significant chunk of blunt is uh, supposed to be a BRT route. So that introduced a little complexity that we needed to deal with. So we looked at initially four options for how to incorporate that. Eric, can you flip to the next one? Yes, there we go. <laughs> all right, so you don't need to see all the details in this, but all the way to the left there, uh, basically the dashed line indicates uh, two-way operation and a solid is one way. So all the way to the left there is sort of a do nothing, keep the one-way and two-way combinations that exist today where Hammond Road is a two-way road, Wake Forest Road is a two-way road, but within downtown, uh, Blunt and person would stay one way. Uh, the second option is what was initially conceived full two-way conversion throughout. Uh, the third option was a bit of a hybrid where just within that BRT stretch on Blunt, traffic would stay one way to facilitate the BRT operations. 
uh, but otherwise it would be converted. And then the fourth option was to stay one way, uh, essentially between MLK and Edenton, but two way outside of that. So we did a lot of traffic analysis on all of these options and essentially um, it doesn't work, but the traffic, uh, I hesitate to use the word work there, but essentially a lot of traffic would divert um, if we converted almost anything. And the, the gist of the problem was that at MLK, it's already a pretty congested intersection and adding additional traffic phases to deal with additional left turns was problematic no matter how we, we approached it, no matter how much traffic, or we had to assume a lot of traffic diversion to make it work. So we actually are now looking at a fifth option, have looked at a fifth option of just converting north of Edenton. So, um, I don't have that figure here, but stay in one way south of Edenton uh, and then north of Edenton, going to two-way operation on Blunt and Person uh, and still having those roundabouts on the north end. And then looking at what else we can do south of Edenton to slow speed. Some of the things that were initially contemplated as part of a phase three landscaping effort, uh, those curb bump outs and other options uh, to slow traffic in other ways just beyond a two-way conversion. So uh, this is, to put everything in context from what Stacey was, was just talking about, we've been embarking on implementing the, the Wake Transit Plan. Um, we developed it um, and developed a regional framework working with, with MPO and other planners from across the region um, to develop a, a regional transit solution. For us, there's multiple components to that. Um, in addition to looking at commuter rail options and looking at a frequent network of 15 minute services or better, uh, we also are working towards implementing four um, BRT corridors in the city. And part of how we're accomplishing this is from a, a half cent sales tax that was approved by voter referendum in 2016. And that laid out a framework for us for 10 years of implementation. So really, not just with talking about blunt person, but with all of our capital um, improvement program and all of our, our capital investments that we're making right now, we're orienting everything to make transit front and center and make it successful. And so as we struggled through those operational considerations for uh, Blunt Street with the introduction of BRT, the, the driving motivating factor was, what's the best outcome that makes transit successful? Um, and how do we not compromise transit operation in the corridor? And that's, a, that's as we're looking at, people often refer to the um, system as sliders. You know, you can, you can make it work for, for cars, but not so good for people. Um, well, in this case, we took transit slider and said, okay, this goes to the top of the list. But given the fact that it's still an NCDOT maintained facility, we still have to do solutions that DOT will sign off on. Um, but you can see the framework here. Newburn is the first of four major corridors that we're working to implement within a 10 year period. And so the, the BRT, uh, as we've got it coming right now, focuses on the Newburn Avenue corridor, but we decided to utilize the existing one way pair framework that we have with Edenton Street. And then, uh, really interesting in terms of the way that downtown is oriented uh, now, we wanted to be able to feed the uh, Go Raleigh Station, which is our primary transit hub in downtown. And so it's opting to use Blunt Street and Wilmington Street as the two north-south corridors. And, and our, our strategy as we start to implement more and more BRT and other transit services in the area is you're gonna to start to see some of our services consolidate into effectively trunk lines along Wilmington and Blunt Street. Uh, and that's gonna make for some significant um, high transit corridor usage. And part of the reason why we're so transit forward on coming up with our solutions for Blunt Street. And so you can see, again, what's on the left side here is what we ended up with in the after condition after we had gone from three lanes down to two. So you can see we've got bike lane, on-street parking on both sides, and two lanes of traffic. Uh, what we have uh, moved forward with for our framework is that as we introduce BRT, and remember, the BRT concepts were not part of our original planning for the blunt person corridor. This is effectively a disruptive technology. And so this was not something that we had on our radar in developing the original corridor plan. And now we have to adapt in order to, to implement bus rapid transit successfully. So that means some of our original assumptions are gonna go out the window. And in this case, 
we're going to sacrifice the bicycle infrastructure along Blunt Street and the on street parking and go with dedicated bus lanes. Uh, and yes, they will likely be painted red, as you see here in the picture. One policy discussion that we're having right now is whether or not we're going to allow bicycle traffic within those bus lanes. I have seen this done in other cities, and it's the type of thing that if you have infrequent bus service introducing some bike traffic, uh, and even bike traffic off peak periods is pretty okay. Once you start to get to where you've got multiple buses per hour, that becomes less and less feasible. So part of the conversation we're gonna have is whether or not we can double down with bicycle infrastructure in the person street corridor or not as a trade-off. So that brings us to talking about the, the downtown cycle track. And um, I'm gonna turn this back over to Stacey to talk you through that. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we really wanted to look at on the west side of downtown was could we put in a cycle track? Uh, Eric, can you go to the next slide? So during some planning efforts, um, the downtown plan update in 2015 and the bike rally plan in 2016, one of the major things that came out of that is that we really needed a north-south connector. There are greenways and parks and major city facilities that just didn't have a great connection through downtown. And so we started looking at ways we could pull that off. And West Street was the first road we looked at. So Eric actually showed this um, slide earlier as an example of, of these narrow streets. So West Street is, is the epitome of that. Uh, you know, West Street, when we began this project, parking on both sides of the road, uh, fairly narrow lanes. And this part of Raleigh is really happening now. You know, there's a lot of pedestrian activity. There's increasing bicycle activity. This seemed like a good option because there is relatively low traffic volume, um, but with a lot of pedestrian and bicycle activity. So this is where we started looking at, all right, how can we introduce a cycle track, uh, a good bicycle connection in this area? And our first concept was to do a two-way cycle track uh, on the west side of West Street, uh, maintaining the parking on the east side. So it was a bit of a balance for businesses in the area. And it would be um, a, you know, protected by the plastic bollards uh, two-way cycle track. And this would go from Target to Morgan. As we sort of got into the details of that design, we encountered a lot of conflict. So there's some narrower street sections. Uh, we get to a railroad crossing that was gonna keep us from continuing our cycle track or continuing uh, the design that we would like to. And so we decided to slide one block east to Harrington Street. So we took basically that same concept, copy, paste one block over. And, and Stacey, I'll point out here that one of those design constraints was for some odd reason, this one block between the railroad and Jones Street, as I mentioned, those other block spaces are, are 40 feet wide. This one was 35. Uh, and then you can see the neck down at the railroad going even smaller. So we couldn't introduce any facility here without just taking out all the on-street parking. We knew that was not going to be palatable, but we had an advantage with Harrington that was much more consistent. Great. So you can see Harrington is quite similar. It's a similar width, similarly parking on both sides of the street. And again, this is a part of downtown with relatively low vehicular volumes, but really increasing pedestrian and bike activity. So we went a step farther once we got onto Harrington Street uh, and we had some, some preliminary drawings put together, uh, we proceeded to have a, a pop-up event. So we were able to get some planters and cones and really mark out for the community to see this is what a cycle track, a two-way cycle track would look like on this street and invited people to come out for the weekend, bike, tell us what they thought, how did it feel, and um, I think we got some really encouraging feedback uh, from people just having a dedicated space to be able to bike north and south through downtown. So here's another picture of the, the pop-up event there in East Raleigh. So we had some concerns though um, all along as we started um, getting into the details of the design. Uh, those of you who are familiar with cycling, especially on a, on a two-way cycle track, probably are familiar with the idea that uh, it's a little challenging. You have turning traffic in multiple directions and bicycles coming in from multiple directions. 
Uh, on the left there is a sketch of the design and on the right is what some preliminary signal designs looked like. And so we had concerns that bicycles uh, would be able to get out in the road before uh, vehicles started turning, the vehicles would see them, the bicycles would see vehicles. And so uh, one way we were looking to mitigate those conflicts was were with bicycle signals. And so we, uh, you, you may know, bicycle signals have interim METCD approval and the city of Raleigh does now have uh, approval from uh, the feds to be able to put in bike signals but you can't just do a leading bicycle interval the way you can do a leading pedestrian interval, uh, at least if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go along with the interim approval. There are some cities who have permission to do things like leading bicycle intervals, uh, but if you go with the letter of the law there, uh, you cannot have any conflicting permissive movements, uh, including turns on red. So we were really stuck with, we feel like we need these bicycle signals to make sure that bicyclists know when to go, and vehicles know when to yield, uh, but that means we're gonna be stuck with exclusive bicycle phases, uh, which also it turns out there's pretty limited guidance out there on how long the green should be, how long the yellow and red should be, and a lot of what does exist very much conflicts with um, NCDOT standards for how uh, green and yellow and red intervals work. And so with that in mind, we started backing away from that, that cycle track concept. And I'm going to turn it back over to Eric here. Yeah, and I want to give credit to NCDOT, the, um, both the division and folks we work with uh, in the central signal unit here in Raleigh. Uh, they were very receptive to helping us work through the phasing issue and being able to introduce that dedicated phasing. Um, but again, with that dedicated phase uh, being added to the signal, the, it, this was not just a paint project. Um, it required significant modifications to the, the traffic signal hardware uh, at the three signals that were in the corridor. We also discovered that uh, where Harrington Street was crossing the railroad track because we were introducing bi-directional traffic, it was currently a, a, a two-quadrant rail gate uh, at the uh, intersection of the CSX corridor with Harrington. And um, by introducing now new two-way traffic onto that, they were likely going to require us to modify the uh, rail signal to be able to add in another gate on that side to prohibit traffic from heading southbound on that on that side of the street. Uh, and many of you, as I as I mentioned, railroad encroachment, uh, the hair on the back of your neck just stood up um, because that would have added about two to three years to our project. Uh, and that really just was not what we were interested in doing to be able to do lighter, quicker, cheaper, faster project implementation. Um, we also uh, started to go back and look at some of the new NACTO guidance that had come out. And I really encourage you, as you're working in urban areas uh, in any part of the state, uh, NACTO has done a good job of publishing uh, new standards and design techniques for, for urban areas specifically. And what we found was, uh, the bottom line was that the, the cycle track, the two-way cycle track was really the, the wrong tool for the job here. Um, when we looked at um, the guidance that NACTO uh, provided for context for um, uh, adjacent uh, parking, for um, driveway spacing, we were not ticking any of those boxes. And so uh, I feel good that we were able to step back, communicate this back to the community, uh, and, and third time was gonna be the charm. And so what we opted for was a more conventional buffered bike lane approach. Uh, and we decided that we would split it up uh, between uh, two different streets, both West and Harrington Street, uh, that we had enough um, right of way in both cases that going in with a, a single bike lane with a buffer, much narrower footprint than what a two-way cycle track would require. So that would allow us to be able to fit that in a little more easily. Uh, this is an example, I believe this is in Chapel Hill. Um, so you can see what we ended up opting for here, basically making a, a giant bicycle one-way pair uh, uh, along this corridor. And our first phase of implementation, uh, because of what we were doing, uh, ended up being about five blocks worth that we could get installed as part of the first phase. Um, one of the big considerations, as I said before, 10 pounds in a five pound bag, something had to give. And in this case, that something was parking. And um, if you're not familiar with downtown Raleigh, as I'm sure it's true in many other cities in, in, in North Carolina, uh, parking is considered uh, sacrosanct. Uh, among retailers. And so um, having that convenience 
is, is, is really important. We've seen that even more so with, with what's happened during COVID. One of the things that we, we sought to do was to explain to the retail community that by removing some of the on-street parking but adding infrastructure, we were going to be bringing more customers uh, by their facilities. Um, another thing that's realistic from the city standpoint is the actual loss in revenue. That is, we're removing metered parking. Uh, we are taking money away from our parking program, and that parking program for, for Raleigh is an enterprise program. Um, and so uh, we're, 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 we're dinging them on what their revenues are going to be. Um, but we were able to work out some things. We did have one unique user in terms of a, a, a new small grocery store. Um, that the building was not designed around having a grocery. It was, it was added after the fact, and we were able to work out. They had one special provision that they did not have the ability to put a tractor trailer on site, and they needed to keep that. So we were able to design a facility around that. But one of the other things that we were able to explain as we were talking to our city council, yes, we're removing on-street parking. However, when you look at the availability of on-street parking in the corridor, both what's existing and what's on tap with all the, all the development that's coming, you can see in the, the bottom half of the table, you're talking about over 2,300 additional parking spaces that are going to be coming on, online in the next two years. And, and all of that is under construction now. And so that was um, uh, really beneficial to be able to make that case for justifying losing uh, about 100 spaces. So as we go forward in the future, one of the things that we're still working through is how exactly we're going to route new BR BRT services through the rest of downtown. I mentioned before, go Raleigh Station. We also have Raleigh Union Station. We're looking at ways that we either connect BRT to one or both or connect BRT to all of those transit hubs. That has some implications in, uh, for how we route transit through downtown. Uh, as I mentioned, we're working actively on the east line. The south and west lines are in planning right now. The north line, we haven't started yet. Um, and if you've seen other presentations that we've done, we're, we've just finished the construction of the reconstruction of Capitol Boulevard. Um, and so now we're talking about, do we look at running BRT service in that newly reconstructed Capitol Boulevard? If so, do we run it in mixed traffic? Do we look at trying to re reconstruct that again for a dedicated BRT? Um, or do we use West Street? And so there's a lot of things under consideration now that, again, we'll revisit some of those trade-offs. And that is all that we've got. And I think we're going to, Josh, I assume we're going to hold questions until the end. Yeah, uh, that would be a good idea to keep things moving and make sure everybody's got plenty of time for presenting. One thing we could do is if you have the ability to kind of easily respond to them in the chat, that might be a good idea. But we can definitely come back at the end if we've got time um, and do that then. So, um Thank you all for your presentation. Very informative. I saw there were a couple questions, so feel free to answer those uh, just in text so people could see them while we keep going. Uh, but we'll go on to the next presentation. So I've got uh, the Wake BRT Transit Signal Priority Innovations uh, with Daniel Johnson, uh, who is a PE with over 16 years experience in the application of traffic and ITS engineering. Uh, he's got his He's a graduate of NC State in electrical engineering. He had uh, nine years at the City of Concord as the city traffic engineer and managed traffic signal and managed the traffic signal division. And he's currently working in the pi private industry, specializing in design, construction, operation, and maintenance. As well. So, uh, without further ado, I will mute myself and disappear. And Daniel, take it away. So it's difficult for me to tell if my if I am sharing a screen, so you ought to see a uh, Nick site based you, PowerPoint you, presentation. You are sharing, so you're good to go. And you can only see one screen. <laughs> that is, yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm just trying to adjust a few things around. Give me just a second. So again, my name is Daniel Johnson. I work with uh, WSP USA and we had the opportunity to begin work on the Wake BRT New Bern Avenue section of the Wake BRT of the four phased Wake BRT project. As part of that, um, I came in to the design phase of developing the 30% traffic signal design plans and 
trying to think through the early piece of the project when it comes to transit signal priority and prioritized based transit movement. Uh, this is just a quick slide of my background. So I, I've worked on a couple of these types of projects. I, I, I've had a, I've had a, some, some lucky opportunities to work on transit signal priority in the city of Nashville with the Murfreesboro Pike Project, the Richmond Pulse, which had some national acclaim. I've worked on the Miami-Dade Dade Busway when they were doing their traffic signal controller transition from older Bytran 170s, as some people with the city of Greensboro, or sorry, the city of Durham will remember, and to a modernized ATC controller. Uh, I've worked with the city of Birmingham, and in my own municipality, uh, in, in cooperation with the NCDOT, we developed some special signal phasing for an intersection right outside of a transit center in Concord, and that was done in 2010. So the implementation of, of bus-specific phasing has been around in North Carolina for a number of years, and but this is really the first opportunity for the Newburn Avenue for a BRT-type deployment, especially in the city of Raleigh, but also new to the state of North Carolina. Um, what, this is what I'm gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk a little bit about BRT. We're gonna talk about the Newburn Avenue project. Uh, the modes of BRT. I'm going to get into the into TSP and some of the applications of transit signal priority, mainly the special phasing uh, options that we've deployed along the Newburn Avenue project. As part of that, I'm going to go into kind of a technology discussion about transit signal priority and the different types of transit signal priority, and I'll do a little cost estimating at the end to kind of tie that together. And hopefully at the end, we'll get to a little bit of lessons learned just from my ITS practice of what I've learned in the, um, the review or the, the trying to close out these projects. There are a lot of things you learn that need to be implemented in the very, very early stages in the planning stage to make sure that contracts and things like that are in the right spot and, and projects can be delivered. Um, and then we'll close with questions. So what is BRT? This is the fabulous marketing wordy statement but to me brt is a bus version of light rail light rail has a dedicated corridor and the rail rides along that corridor separate from traffic in order to provide more efficient mobility uh, to reduce that cost and to make things more flexible in my honest opinion a bus rapid transit system offers that in the various mode options. So it can be general purpose traffic, it can be dedicated bus lanes, it can be a dedicated lane within the standard corridor. So BRT is, is dedicated bus corridor to provide you know, speed and reliability and hopefully reduce vehicles off the road so, so those of us that have to commute can do that more efficiently. So Wake County Transit Plan has really four goals. And the goal that I really like to focus on within this plan is the connecting of the region. And on the next slide, you'll see, this is a slide that Eric Lamb pulled up earlier. There are four phases to the Wake BRT project in order to connect the region. So we're currently gonna talk about the Newburn Avenue, which is going east out of downtown. Everything centers around this downtown core in at the transit center of downtown Raleigh. There's a segment going north on Capitol Boulevard, a segment going south to Garner, and another segment uh, proceeding out of downtown along Western Boulevard to the, to the transit center within the town of Cary. So the Newburn Avenue project offers 5.1 miles of transit signal priority. So the total length of the project, we're gonna, we, we developed a strategy for transit signal priority at each of those, at each traffic signal along that full length of corridor. 3.3 miles of that is dedicated transit lanes in some form between downtown and Sunnybrook Road or Wake Mid. Uh, extending from that Sunnybrook Road to the east is general purpose. And sometimes people don't think about general purpose as being very, um, very important, but that being a really heavily congested area, um, transit signal priority offers a tremendous amount of benefit in those general purpose lane areas, so we definitely kept that incorporated into the plan. So in BRT, there are three modes within this particular project and, and most others. There, there are uh, dedicated transit lanes, uh, there's transit way, and there's mixed travel. And then this project incorporates, uh, because there is a transit way segment, 
we have special phasing so the bus can enter from general purpose lanes or transit lanes into the transit way and exit that transit way into general purpose lanes as part of what we're going to call Q jumps or special dedicated transit phasing. Um, there are also going to be transit lane transitions where you go from say an inside lane to or, or sorry an outside lane to an inside lane that's the predominant example we're going to show and then prioritize left and right turn movements. So here, here's another map similar to what was talked about in the first session of the entire section of the New Bern Avenue corridor. Uh, this one somewhat highlights with this dash line the general purpose area from Sunnybrook to New Hope. The dedicated transit lane or the dedicated transit way segment between Pole Road and Sunnybrook and that one-way pair segment that Eric talked about leading into downtown. So here are the various modes. Uh, you'll see these are very similar to the to the previous discussion where here's Blount Street. Actually, let me turn on this fancy laser pointer. Here's Blount Street with a dedicated transit lane on the right uh, one-way lane, turning right onto Martin Street, right onto Wilmington Street, uh, continuing and turning right on Megan or Morgan Street, and then continuing on to Newburn. So now in the one-way pairs, again, we're going to continue that, that dedicated transit lane in the one-way pairs. And notice these kind of blocked out areas. This is where right turning vehicles will co-mingle within the transit lane um, in order to turn right on the cross streets. It is this crossover that makes transit signal priority somewhat more difficult than just being you know, a detector in the pavement. Now we have to separate the bus itself from the vehicles that, that co-mingle within those lanes. And then we also have stations after intersections. We have stations before intersections. Those also create a level of complexity. So from Pool Road to, to Sunnybrook, we have a dedicated transit way. Um, I like to call this median running, median running bus lanes um, from my terminology. But this was a great graphic that was put together to show what that's going to look like in the future. And from Sunnybrook to New Hope Road, here's just simply the bus traveling in general purpose lanes. This was a video. I'm really hoping that this video is going to play. Sometimes embedded YouTube likes to act a little crazy. So I'm going to try to slow it down and we're going to jump forward. We're not going to watch the whole five minute segment. But what this video is going to do is it's going to show existing condition transferring into the future condition. And this starts um, right around a minute and 25 seconds if I can get it to do it. I may have to slow back down again. Okay, we're still going a little slow. So right about a minute and 30, 26 seconds, we'll start the real depth of videos. This is a great marketing video. It's available on, on YouTube. One way pair into downtown. So now the video is going to highlight a couple points along the way, um, but now we're going to focus in on Sunnybrook and then it will provide a really good view. So the top view, you can see existing Sunnybrook or existing New Bern Avenue and then the transition. Sorry, it's not a little bit slower in this. Uh, PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't let you slow down. So here we are in dedicated lanes. So this is the transition at Pool Road that's somewhat complex where the bus separates 
and we'll see an example of, of Q jump as it progresses into the one-way pair. Dedicated bus only lanes. And honestly, this is just a little bit of an extra. This is an example of elevated platform and level boarding that I think is just a fantastic way of doing boarding into this type of facility. So you see a, an ADA person in a wheelchair. Uh, you have to have the bus within maybe two inches. We learned this was part of the Pulse project in Richmond. The bus literally almost touches or does touch the uh, the edge of the platform to get close enough so a wheelchair can roll directly onto the bus. I just think it's a great example of that in the video. So I'm gonna pause the video and we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so what is transit signal priority? Transit signal, and again, here is the big long wordy uh, marketing version of what that is. But in the end, transit signal priority is the ability to identify the vehicle, if that's a bus or a transit vehicle, that's it. It's also very similar for emergency vehicle preemption. Uh, identify the vehicle, and the system then provides that vehicle with prioritized traffic signal timing or prioritized traffic signal phasing or movements, queue jumps, lane shifts, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's equipment involved and hardware and software involved in order to facilitate those changes. So this map is, is, a, is just a, a newer version of the map that we've seen earlier, breaking down into the three different modes of the BRT. But it also, what it also is doing is identifying where these Q-Jump locations are. And there are really four highlighted ones that we're gonna show in, in, the, next, in the next couple of slides. So one is at uh, Edenton at Blunt Street, another at Newburn Avenue at Tarboro, Newburn Avenue at Pool Road, which is probably uh, geometrically the most complex intersection. Um, and then a, a point of note, we're gonna show a lane shift at Newburn and Tarboro. Reason being is we have to move a transit vehicle from the outside curb running lane to the inside curb running lane in order to get it prepared to enter the transit way. So we do that, we basically do a, a Q jump at Newburn and Tarboro in order to align the bus properly to enter into the transit way beginning at Pool Road. Uh, there is a similar type uh, dedicated transit phasing at Sunnybrook that we'll also show at the end. So in the 30% design plans, you'll see this is very similar to NCDOT design standards because um, this is a DOT corridor. On the right side, we have, turn on the magic pointer here. On the right side, we have head 83, which is the METCD LRT BRT head that is utilized for transit vehicles. That head is uh, head 83. Oh, let me back up. This is Blount Street at Edenton. So this is going to be uh, outside bus lane doing a prioritize left turn movement to enter into another uh, block of, of transit lanes. Uh, and the way we're showing this is with this dedicated right, or showing it with this dedicated arrow segment, the phasing diagram with BRT underneath it. So here is the VISM. Bus is approaching. There's actually a near side stop. Bus then proceeds to the stop bar. And based on the, the trans signal priority or trans signal priority based uh, hardware, the bus is detected and that bus is enabled to jump in front of the Edenton traffic. So jump to the next one, this is Tarboro. So this, 
I'm not going to really go through phasing diagrams in order, you know, it's a factor of time. So this is outside curb running lane, lane shift to inside curb running lane at Tarboro in order to prepare the bus to enter the transit way. This one might make people a little, little dizzy because it will do a little flyaway inside the video. Once it recaptures the bus, you'll see it actually performing the, the, the lane shift movement in the background there. Newburn Avenue at Pool Road. There are really two things happening at this intersection. Now that we have the bus aligned in, in the inside uh, curb running lane, the eastbound movement is actually very simple. It's just a, a straight through movement that can operate with phase two, as long as there are you know, uh, no right turn conflicts or anything else. Um, but for the westbound approach, this is actually a right turn pseudo right turn slash lane shift to go from transit way and then progress to curb running lane. And lastly, this is Newburn Avenue at Sunnybrook. The challenge with this one is how do we get the bus into the transit way segment from general purpose lanes? And the way this, we tried, you know, moving the bus into a left only or left of the dual left turn lane. And the solution at the end was to leave the bus adjacent to the through movement, but have it as a, as a phase that can operate with the through movement while the dedicated left turn is stopped. So just from a context, we are looking westbound. So this segment here is where the trans is the transit lane we're trying to focus on. There's a transit vehicle operating with phase six and progressing into the transit lane and stopping at the egress station. Okay, so a little bit of a technical conversation about transit signal priority. This is the, you know, the how you do it. Um, there are really four overall concepts of how transit signal priority works from a technology standpoint. Uh, there's distributed based systems, which is really a system that is standalone at each intersection and dedicated to that particular location. And then there are centralized based systems. Um, inside of the distributed system, the one I don't have a slide for is just simply local, a locally detected solution. This is how Dade Busway operates in Florida um, on the non-express lane buses. There is a extension loop similar to what we all see with traffic signals in North Carolina, and there is a presence detector at the stop bar, and the bus literally actuates the uh, the busway to get priority every single at every single intersection. It approaches on red and then actuates to green to progress forward. Now, this isn't a very efficient way to do it. Also, considering that when you're using local detection, the main issue is what if other vehicles are in the busway as well? And in Dade Busway, all the county vehicles also travel inside the busway. So it becomes very challenging to separate the transit vehicle from other vehicles with this type of solution. So the other solution that a lot of us are familiar with from the emergency vehicle preemption side of the game is now the new trigger word is V to X or V to I type solution. So vehicle to infrastructure or vehicle to X is anything. So this solution, uh, the transit vehicle, this laser pointer, transit vehicle has a device 
install a hardware device installed on the vehicle. That hardware device communicates to a detection device at the traffic signal cabinet, and the controller in the cabinet receives an input and then runs prioritized phasing. Um, this is a hardware only based solution. There obviously is software to do configuration setup and, and prioritization. Um, and then the controller has priority running in it, but really this is a hardware solution for each location. And we'll talk about the cost of that in just a minute. This is very prevalent in most cities for emergency vehicle preemption, and most of those systems can also be set up to operate as transit systems. Um, yeah, moving forward. So centralized systems, there's really two styles or options for a centralized based system. If an organization already has a traffic signal advanced traffic management system uh, or central system, much like the city of Raleigh already has, there is the opportunity to purchase an add-on module for some systems that can perform the priority-based uh, request as a module. So there are really five steps in this process. So the bus itself has devices already loaded on it that are tracked by the transit management system. Uh, we call this the transit CAD. In the city of Raleigh, this is the clever devices. In some other cities, this is a, a, a brand or a, or a company called Trapeze. Um, so there, there are a number of vendors that provide this. So in the city of Raleigh, we're talking about clever devices. And then clever devices sends all this data, the position of the bus, which is not real time, by the way, uh, the speed of the bus, position of the bus, and possibly some other metrics like door open, door closed, and schedule adherence and time. And those timestamps are then forwarded on to the priority route generator, which is the module that's part of the ATMS. Inside of this priority route generator is going to be a kind of a, a, a document of what the transit schedule is. And then it compares the information that came from the transit CAD to its embedded or saved transit schedule and, and identifies is the bus behind schedule do we need prioritized timing or do we need prioritized phasing if it's at an intersection that requires that and then this module sends information or sends a request to the central system the central system then sends a request to the traffic signal controller in the field through physical network so this is option number one option number two is a third party option you'll see a very similar graphic but truly this option only has three individual pieces. So the third party system starts with some type of software being loaded on the transit vehicle itself. And that software is provided by the third party vendor. It then communicates to either an on-premise solution or cloud-based system and, and provides the data of location of the bus, speed of the bus, door open, door close, and any of the metrics that may be needed in order to, to identify priority. This system has an understanding of what the schedule is, so that that schedule print is saved within this system. And then it can send directly to the controller bypassing the central system a request for priority. Typically, these systems are uh, software as a service. So there is typically an annual fee to this type of system. Uh, with the city of Raleigh, we've honestly looked at, at something that complements their, their particular central system, and we've looked at uh, a third party option like this in the, in the early, early planning phase. So here's a breakdown of the money. As a, as a maintenance operations person, this is where it all comes, comes together for me is, is how much is it gonna cost? Well, if you don't have a controller that operates with priority, you're gonna to have to do a controller upgrade. Uh, just the controller itself is a three to $4,000 expense. A V to X solution um, or hardware-based solution that we talked about, that was kind of option one or what we called the distributed system. Uh, the individual intersections cost about $10,000 each and the vehicle hardware itself is about $5,000 per vehicle. So if we look at 150 intersections and 20 vehicles, that's $1.6 million in hardware. 
So now if we look at a centralized based system, which is why things are moving into this new age of software only, we've seen quotes for a 42, actually one of the products I worked on, it was a 42 intersection system. The cost for the add-on module on top of all their other expenses was $600,000. So we already have a, drast, a drastic difference in expense at that point going software only. These third or these these add-on modules do come with an annual uh, maintenance agreement requirements that you have to program into your budget. A centralized third-party option again is a software as a service. So this is why the 150 intersection became prevalent uh, between the hardware-only solution and software-only solution. Um, these uh, these types of solutions usually have a pretty bulk a pretty large bulk of money at the very early segment of of project start and then they they decrease in price as it gets bigger so you can see uh, one of the cost estimates we got from a third party vendor was 20 intersections and six vehicles was seventy thousand dollars annually um, so you know there's there's a pretty extreme difference between that annual expense and something that would be a hardware only solution and in some case the hardware hardware only solution may be may be more cost for, cost effective uh, for the 150 intersections and 20 vehicles being $160,000 annually, it would take somewhere between eight and 10 years to find an equal value uh, between a hardware solution and a third party solution. So just food for thought for all the planners working on budgets for MPOs. So one of the things I wanna talk about, I know I'm right at the end of time, but I always like to talk about lessons learned being someone that's worked on these projects at an acceptance level these are the things that need to be not need to be understood at the very beginning of the process and in the planning process to help move projects forward and to try to get a seamless acceptance at the very end so number one to me from my experience is every product i've worked on there is a contrasting expectation between what the transit operation group wants to do and what traffic operations sees as feasible in the pavement. And we're talking about the people that sit in the transit management area, what they wanna see for the transit vehicle versus what the city of Raleigh or the entity would see in the TMC for vehicle mobility. There's always some difference of opinion that occurs between these two bodies. Um, the city of Nashville tried to overcome this by early, early, early on in the process, they developed operating rules. So these two organizations got together early on and they identified, okay, what are the, what's the maximum amount of green time that we'll allow along a corridor for transit signal priority for signal timing? And they came up with a 10% number, 10% of cycle length number. So each intersection at max could add or utilize 12 seconds, 12 to 15 seconds of green within that particular cycle length. And then another rule that they determined was if we're going to allow Q jumps or you know, Q jumps that are very specific about getting the transit vehicle in front of vehicles for timing purposes, we can only do those Q jumps once or twice a cycle. Um, operating rule similar to that. So number two is, is make sure that the project owner understands the capabilities of the system itself and the hardware. Early on, that's very difficult to understand. And it's also very difficult to write that into a contract document to say, at the very end, we wanna make sure that our system does X, Y, and Z. So it's very important to bring in a technical expert to define that because surprisingly enough, during the acceptance process, this is something that always becomes very challenging. Uh, the owner always has an expectation and then the software or the, the, the provider may not have fully met that to the detailed ex expectation of the product owner. Uh, number three, Q jumps are very difficult to do. It looks very simple within the VISA model, but when you start talking about it from a signal controller standpoint, software standpoint and then an integration of system standpoint it becomes very difficult to do q jumps some controllers have it programmed in as a standard feature a lot of other controllers do not 
and it has to be handled with special logic statements and um, it just it's 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 not, it's a very complex thing it may seem simple but it in in operation it becomes very difficult uh, this is really a high, a key one is understand how the system is going to provide you with metrics to identify performance are those you know at the end you want to say we got better travel time reliability the bus is operating at a more optimum um, adherence to schedule Th those are great things to say from the from the early stages but how do you actually identify that at the end of the project when you have to fill out the report to send to fta to identify that hey this project was a success and we actually did reduce travel time make sure that the system provides you with a mechanism in order to do that whether it's reporting or whatnot uh, the last thing i think anybody wants to do is sit on a bus with a stopwatch before and after and use that as your confirmation that the project was successful. I have seen that done, and I have done that. Um, ITS software is never off the shelf. This is a matter of experience for me. I've bought a lot of software and supported clients buying a lot of software. Um, always have a mechanism written in your contract that if there's feature requirements or development or customization, that, that, that that's defined up front and it's included in the cost. This becomes something that's very challenging to navigate at the very end of a contract, especially when all the money's gone. Um, and get, get your technical expert on board early, um, especially in the planning phase, so you can cover all these other things. There are a lot of other lessons learned that I've found, but getting a technical expert on board early is, is strategic in any planning of BRT or any technology in ITS. And with that, I'll leave that with you, and I thank you for your time. And, I say questions, but I know we're gonna wait until the end. Yeah, and real quick, Daniel, thank you very much for that presentation. I think Sravia is putting, apparently we're having uh, issues with the questions tab and people aren't able to respond. So we're, Sravia is actually putting those in the chat now um, and maybe we can get some responses in there. That might be good as we're running a little behind here. Uh, I did want to real quick, just in case people run away right at the end remind everybody that there is the annual meeting networking event from five to seven uh, i think that email claudio sent that out so if you're looking for that information um, it probably came from claudio that email that will have the link and all the um, instructions uh, i'm going to keep the the uh, bios very brief here to maximize the time for this presentation so we do have uh, mike rachel and john are going to be doing a presentation on a vision for North Carolina's first multi-way boulevard, balancing the goals of all users along Capitol Boulevard in Raleigh, North Carolina. So this is a collaboration from De WSP, which is a sponsor of this whole segment, and the city of Raleigh. Uh, so once again, Mike Sarasky uh, is WSP's Southeast Region Operations Manager and has a lot of uh, transit traffic background. Um, Rachel is a transit planner with a focus on multimodal transportation and transit and rail projects. And uh, John has many degrees, including uh, environmental science from NC State, uh, Master's of Public Administration from UNC Wilmington, and Master's in City and Regional Planning from UNC Chapel Hill, and is a long-range planner at the City of Raleigh. So I will let them jump right into it and take it away, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Can uh, you give us the ability to share? Yes, uh, and so this presentation is about uh, Capitol Boulevard in Raleigh, it's in the northeast part of Raleigh. And so we've been working on this project for about two years now, a little over two years, and it is called Capitol Boulevard North, is the name of the planning process. And what we've developed over the course of those two years is a concept for a multi-way boulevard uh, for Capitol Boulevard between I-440 and I-540. So that's us once again. Uh, next slide, please. And so we'll talk a little bit about what went into this corridor study, and then we'll talk about what uh, the concept actually shows for that multi-way boulevard. Next slide, please. So to give you a sense of where we're talking about, uh, Capitol Boulevard course extends from downtown Raleigh to the northeast towards Wake Forest and Franklin County. And the particular segment that's being studied in the Capitol Boulevard North Corridor study is between 440 and 540. And it's about four and a half miles long. 
And this section is pretty standard the whole way through, eight lane section. Uh, it does expand to 10 lanes at inter certain intersections for turn lanes, as you can see in this image. And next slide, please. And here's a little bit of a closer look. This image is turned on its side. So north is to the right and south is to the left. And I'll just point out a couple of things about the character of the corridor, uh, namely that you do have some anchors at either end. So the north end on the right, there is the regional shopping mall Triangle Town Center at the intersection interchange with 540 uh, and also in that area an agglomeration of large shopping centers and car dealerships. At the south end, there is the Highwoods Office Park uh, with a pretty good amount of office space. And then in between, uh, it is a, a mix of commercial uses and tends to be smaller scale at the south end, larger scale at the north end. And the other thing I want to point out is the, the fairly rapid transition to residential areas once you leave the commercial corridor itself. Uh, and those neighborhoods are very diverse, have a mix of incomes, and in the central portion of the corridor just north of Lewisburg Road uh, is one of the areas of Raleigh that has the lowest rate of vehicle ownership uh, per household. Next slide, please. So when we started in this corridor study, we wanted to really layer together all the components of good planning. And so that starts with you know, our, our core issue that we were trying to solve is the growth and traffic volume that we're projecting out for the next 25 years. Uh, but then of course, any improvements to the street system and Capitol Boulevard itself is gonna change uh, the type of development that's possible and demanded over that course of, of time. And then we also wanna tie the street improvements to the neighborhoods and the shopping destinations along the corridor with a robust bicycle and pedestrian network. Uh, and then finally, to ensure that all of those changes are benefiting the folks who live and work and own businesses here currently, uh, and that they, there is a shared benefit from these investments by the city and the state. Next slide, please. And so there has been uh, quite a bit of public outreach over the course of two years of this study. And we really wanted to work our way from the beginning, having a, a very abstract and value-based period of public outreach, just listening to the, to the community in terms of what their goals and thoughts were about how they experience this area today and how they'd like to experience it in the future. And then as we moved through those stages, uh, moving towards more specific recommendations for the actual improvements that we wanted to make. And that's how we got to where we are today. And so let's look at some of the ideas that we heard from the community when we asked those questions at the beginning of the study. And so the number one issue that we heard from residents and, uh, and really everyone in this area, people that live here and people that use the corridor was to relieve the traffic congestion. Um, I personally, just coming from a planner's perspective, actually think Capitol Boulevard works very well, all things considered, but uh, the community perception was that traffic is a major concern. And of course, with the growth in volume that we're anticipating, uh, which is, you know, uh, upwards of 50% compared to today, uh, certainly is something that we need to keep track of. But there was a balance of the issues that we heard from the community as well. So traffic was the number one, but it was not substantially uh, more of an issue far and away than, than other issues that were identified, particularly safety, safety for pedestrians crossing Capitol Boulevard and accessing transit stops. And that was a concern, I think it's important to note, not just for people who use transit and people who, who are walking on Capitol Boulevard, but everyone that we spoke to, whether they just commute through the area, whether they own businesses, uh, it, everyone really felt strongly that safety for pedestrians is, was a very high concern. And then, generally uh, helping the, the corridor to start to evolve from its more commercial and light industrial character that it has today and move to a more mixed use uh, and more employment-based area for the city. Next slide, please. And so here's a few numbers to just go along with that. And you can see, of course, uh, the traffic congestion and safety being the top issues identified by the community. Um, and so that was really what we were looking at. We were considering what designs for Capitol Boulevard were gonna best solve those issues, but also provide uh, those benefits to the community and those, those comprehensive benefits um, across all the issues that we heard from people in this area. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Rachel and she'll take it from here. So oh, I'm, I'm gonna take it from here, John. I'm sorry, you're fine. You're fine. That's good. I, that way I could test to make sure people could hear me. So if you could hear me, then that's fine. So that was good. Um, as John mentioned, he introduced this um, concept of this multi-way boulevard. So 
you know, one of the biggest questions that we had to ask on this project right from the beginning of the project is, you know, what's the most important thing here? And, and we, we struggled with what we call the through and to concept. We know that a lot of people use this section of Capitol Boulevard for us through traffic. They're, they enter at the north end, exit the south end in the a.m. and vice versa in the p.m. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure, as shown in the public involvement, that the two, so the trips to and from within the corridor, were just as important as those trips going through the corridor. So we we collected a lot of data. You know, we wanted to see if the data that we collected on the traffic side, and this is for the geeky folks out there, so you'll get a kick out of it. Um, wanted to see if it did match what the public perception was. And so what we did was, is we we took. Um, we tested a couple alternatives with traffic modeling software with the forecast a year for 2045. We did use BISIM um, because we did include um, it as, as a, it's, we didn't look at each thing uh, individually. We looked at it as a whole corridor um, and then looked at different street types, which included um, different lineage, different changes to the intersections. Mainly one was an urban thoroughfare, which, um, which had a lot of interchanges on it, but would still have uh, direct access. And the other one was a multi-way boulevard which essentially is you're separating what we call the local and express lanes. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Rachel. So when we talk about through trips, we wanted to really see how much of those daily trips are those through trips. And as you can see there, um, we're talking about between, you know, 27 to 30% of through trips. Those are the ones that are, that are through, that are through trips. So we, we do know that while the public, you know, the public said, 47% of the public said that the through traffic was extremely important. What we found is that the through trips, the, the amount of through trips does back up what the public was telling us. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And so we took streetlight data and we looked at it all day. So this is not necessarily right at peak hours. This is all day and saw really exactly where those outside to outside trips were happening and where they were coming from inside. You can see the dark blue on the right is our external trips. So what Streetlight's telling us is 32% of the traffic on Capitol Boulevard is strictly through traffic. The other ones are, are not through traffic. They're at least internal, completely internal or from outside the corridor to inside the corridor. What that means, and we, we actually thought it would set them the external to external was higher than that. Um, what that told us is that there are a lot of reasons for people to stop or start in this corridor. And we wanted to add a note here that John actually mentioned to us the other day, which we thought was, was, a, was a good um, note for this, was 20% of all retail in the city of Raleigh is within the Capitol Boulevard North Corridor. So I think people real, don't realize how much retail there is in this corridor. I mean, there's a lot of retail, but don't realize how much retail. There's a lot of office. There's more office in this corridor, and I've, I've driven this corridor for almost 20 years, uh, probably longer than that, and didn't realize how much office was actually in this corridor. And so, you know, we, we really wanted to find a solution that balanced both the through trips and making sure that we keep the sanctity of the businesses that are out there now and for the future businesses that will come along this corridor. Go ahead, Rachel. And so we did that analysis using the multi-way boulevard, which is which we're going to show pictures of here in a minute. But what this shows, and then this, this might be a little hard to read, but this is time frame. So what we wanted to show from, from an analysis perspective was not necessarily level of service, but time. Because I think the, the, the driving public understands time much more than they understand level of service. I mean, how many traffic engineers have been out there where you go to a meeting, and you tell them level of service D, and we all think that's great, and they equate that to a grade in school. I mean, that happens all the time. So we would we'd rather tell people time. And what you see here is we did 2045 no build and 2045 with our bid build alternative. And I'm just going to highlight two things. If you look at the southbound through in the AM, it's almost 60 minutes to get through the corridor in 2045 as it stands right now, doing nothing. With this, we are taking that down to about between six and seven minutes. And that is strictly through traffic. This is so we're talking about the through traffic strictly. Now what we found is, and it's not shown on here, is that the travel time on the local lanes also goes down because you are splitting out that traffic. We are we are essentially removing the through traffic from those local lanes that are closer to the businesses and easy to access all those businesses. And so travel time was really the most important thing. It's something that when we explained it to the public, it was really easy for them to understand. So that that's one of the major metrics that we used in deciding what was the best alternative for this project. Go ahead, Rachel. And so our preferred alternative was the multi-way boulevard. And as you can see here, this is a kind of an isometric shot of it. Um, we do have uh, BRT lanes, even though it is not in the current Wake County Transit Plan, we did put, put as part of this a plan to have BRT center running as part of this because, uh, I mean, it's a theme of this 
presentation section. We, we're going to put BRT on all these projects. We, we know that Raleigh and Wake County has shown a commitment to BRT by just having this, these presentations alone. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we put that BRT in there because, as John mentioned, there's a lot of people in this corridor that don't have cars. The number one bus, which is the bus on Capitol Boulevard, is the highest, uh, has the highest ridership in the system right now. Um, this is also an extremely dense area. The Wake County Transit Plan has shown us that the area around the 4011 interchange uh, is the, one of the densest areas of Raleigh. So all signs are leading to some sort of transit happening here. And so we, we went ahead and planned for BRT in the center. Um, what this is also showing is you, you have express lanes in the middle, which are those through lanes. And then you have local lanes on the outside, which will supply access to businesses. Now, one of, the, one of the keys with this study is that we are not just looking at businesses accessing the local lanes, but businesses also ac accessing the parallel routes. And so the connections from the interchanges, which you'll see on the next slide, the, the, the connections from the interchanges to behind some of these properties is just as important as the access on Capitol Boulevard itself. So it's really, you know, when you look at a corridor, it goes back to doing a corridor study. This is a corridor study, but no corridor studies just look at the one corridor. It's about the system. It's about all those parallel routes and all those other things happening around it, which we're going to get into a little bit later. We get way more into bike ped details on those things down the road. So here are interchange types with this interchange or with this multi-way boulevard concept. We don't have a lot of options for interchanges. It's typically either going to be a diamond interchange or a single point urban uh, interchange. And so we basically all of those, uh, those two types are the ones that we have here. We also have two places which are marked in X's where we have great separated pedestrian crossings. And those are places where we know that there's a lot of pedestrians crossing the road now. Uh, we felt that we couldn't have, inter you need to separate out the interchanges. You can't have interchanges on top of interchanges. Plus we needed a place for the flip ramps, which we're just about to show in a minute. And so these are locations where there's a lot of pedestrian activities. We felt these would be the best places for uh, pedestrian grade separations. They also could act as gateways to certain parts of the city, as you see with other pedestrian um, grade separations around in other places, including in Ralph. So this is a plan view. And what you see here are slip lanes from the express lanes to local lanes. Um, this is at the, the, the bottom part of this is at the New Hope Church Buffalo Road intersection, which would become an interchange. We are assuming that Capitol Boulevard, the express lanes would go over and that there would be stations, CRT stations somewhere around these major interchanges and there's enough room in this for that. Two things here that I want to point out. One is, is that the footprint of this is larger than the current footprint of Capitol Boulevard, but what we wanted to really do, one of the main things we wanted to do when we talked about balancing local uh, local trips or through trips is to try and keep the existing uh, the existing edges as close to grade as possible. So that's part of this is that we're trying to keep those as close as possible so that there's not a lot of deterioration to the businesses along the corridor. We want to make sure that they can keep their parking areas. If we have to move their parking areas behind, we want to make sure that there's enough space there and to keep their access. We want to make sure the businesses can still have access. So really the change in grade is going to be for the express lane. Those are going to be the places where there's changing grade. If you, as an example, um, if you've ever seen US 19 north of Tampa, it's a very good example of this type of roadway um, where the express lanes do go up and down, where the local lanes pretty much stay on grade. Um, the other thing I want to mention here is that this is a SUI, so this will be treated as a, as a single point urban interchange. And we will, uh, we could in, include the use of Texas U turns, as we say there. We may have a Texas U-turn under the bridge because you're going to have a lot of people U-turning that, you know, are making right at a local lane. They can't they want to go back the other direction. Texas U-turns is a great way to get that traffic to go back towards the other direction. Go ahead and go to the next slide so we can show the other type of slip lane. So this is the, that, that one showed the slip lane <clears throat> from the express to local. This is a local to express. Um, express will always have right away. in these. There's going to be some places, depending on the traffic, as you get more into the design, and more into the analysis into this in the future, there might be places where the local lanes actually yield to the express lane slip off ramp. So it could be different in locations depending on the amount of traffic, could be one lane, could be two lanes, but these are located in places that are far enough away from the interchanges so that the, the weaving can happen. And the other thing I wanna point out too is that between the, between the slip ramps, the express lanes are only two lanes and that way the lane that comes on, the lane that comes on, I'm, I'm doing this on my table and no one can see me. The lanes that come on um, can will stay on till they go off again. So you'll have two lanes in the express lanes between the slip ramps and three lanes uh, after those slip ramps come on and then before they go off. Go ahead and go to the next one, Rachel. 
And so I talked a little bit about bike ped, and I'm going to turn it over to Rachel here in a minute to talk about more in-depth bike ped things. But one of the things we wanted to make sure of is we saw, as, as in the picture that was shown earlier, there's a lot of people, and if you drive down this road a lot, you know, there's a lot of people that, as I call it, frogger across this road now. And they will cross at any place. It doesn't matter if it's an inter intersection or not an intersection or whatever reason they're doing it. But they cross at a lot of places. And one of the things that we wanted to take into consideration here was pedestrians crossing this road. With this concept, we are actually going to lower or, or decrease the amount of space that pedestrians have to cross the road. So while the footprint is larger, they're crossing less lanes and, other, and they're crossing them in steps. They're not crossing them all at one time. So it's, so it's in, in, you know, they'll cross one local lane, be able to walk, cross another local lane. The other thing too here that we wanted to point out is we wanted to have options for separated bike lanes. It's, a, it's one of the big things that BPAC in the city wants to do right now and that the transportation planning group and planning is doing right now. So we wanted to have three options for separated bike lanes and that's what's shown here. So, you know, depending on the amount of bicycle traffic or, you know, the other traffic that's available or the lane that's available on these bridges, these are three examples of how we could do those separated bike lanes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to talk more about the rest of the project. And so this is just one example of how we mapped out the bicycle and pedestrian improvements throughout the corridor. We really wanted to prioritize them. Kind of high priorities are ones that connect to the existing system and and build on what's already going on out along the corridor. You know, midterm kind of follows along with the multi-way project and is implemented as um, as the roadway changes. And then longer term, looking to connect to regional trails and some of the destinations outside of the study area. And so, kind of in in addition to the multi-way boulevard and the transportation elements that we looked at as part of this study, we also looked at three land use vision areas. So these were specific areas along the, the corridor um, that we wanted to develop visions for, and that could also lead to policy recommendations. And so these three sites were chosen with public feedback, um, and then also based on some of the characteristics that might be seen throughout the corridor, so not just unique to the specific areas. So what we did using the City of Raleigh's current future land use map, along with information from the market analysis that we gathered at the beginning part of the study, um, we developed some recommendations for the future land use of these areas, along with the height that potentially could be seen, um, you know, understanding where BRT might be located, understanding the local street networks and the regional street networks that um, were being proposed, what might be um, viable future land use in these areas. And so then in order to help the public kind of better understand some of these concepts and what we're proposing, um, we developed these models to show these future land uses and heights um, to kind of just provide a visual for the future land use in the area and also to show some of these street networks that we are proposing. Again, as Mike said, you know, it's not just focusing right on Capitol Boulevard, but how do we start making these connections um, throughout the study era, area and um, outside of the, the corridor as well. That will take we'll take any questions if you want to ask questions of us now or wherever Josh wants to handle. Uh, let's see. I think they. Let's see. Da, 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 da. I think we've got. Do we have most of them answered or not really? Stravi, I know some of them. It looks like we have no new ones for your all's presentation yet. And I know Sravia said she wanted to kind of uh, quickly show uh, the advertisement for the sponsor of this session, WSP. Sravia, can you hear me? I can, Josh. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to take it from here? Sure, yeah. Um, there are a few questions um, in the chat box that I've copied. Um, I don't know. I know earlier there was an issue for the panelists to see the questions or be able to answer the questions. So I can give you a few minutes um, to do that. Okay, Eric, yeah. there, it looks like there are some for you. That's okay. And Stacey, gonna... yeah. Okay, go, I was gonna say, if you wanna take it away, it looks like maybe none for the current group, but maybe a few for the previous groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some for Daniel, Stacey and Eric, I think. So. Do you want to go, Sravi, or would you like me to read them? I can read them. The okay, first okay. question is, can scooters use the cycle track as the question from Rhett Russell? Eric, I believe it's you and Stacy. 
Yeah, we we're calling these bike lanes, but in in fact, it's, it's intended to support our entire micro mobility franchises that we are introducing in our market. So absolutely, scooters are happy to use those. Sounds good. Um, second question: um, With the introduction of the new bun BRT, how will bicycle facilities be accommodated instead of just being removed after they have already been introduced on Blunt Street? Questions from Andrea Gordon. So um, the plan for the Newburn Avenue corridor right now is to actually build um, separated facilities behind the curb as part of retrofits uh, for the entire corridor. And um, it doesn't penetrate all the way into downtown on Blunt in person, but along Newburn and along Edenton Street, uh, it'll be modifying the existing sidewalk that's behind the curb and converting that to a multi-use path. So Eric, I think the question was relative to the bicycle facilities on Blunt. So I think you had mentioned oh, yeah. the city's considering allowing bicycles in the um, bus lane. And we are also looking at, uh, now that we know we will not be able to convert that section of person, can we get bike lanes in both directions? And we're working on that now. Um, the next question for you both is, do you all consider, or are you even able to, um, lowering the signal progression speed on person blunt to control speeds. That's the question from Zachary Bug. So we're definitely going to be looking at lots of options for lowering speeds uh, along person and blunt. I think there are a lot of things on the table. It's a little tough to change the signal timing at any one section of downtown because the grid plays uh, together so closely, but we are going to be looking at a lot of options to lower speeds. Daniel, next question for you from Jeff Ager. Um, Won't the landscaping depicted between the dedicated bus lanes and the general purpose lanes block the visibility of pedestrians crossing at mid block locations with or without dedicated crosswalks? It's, it's an interesting question because does it indicate or is the question about crossing at non crosswalk locations? I think. Yeah, he mentioned mid block locations. Yeah. So, I mean, I think with all of these projects with the bus and that we've tried to, the design tries to accommodate for pedestrians at fixed locations. And any of the landscaping is to, or the blocking is to limit pedestrian crossing at mid block. So. Yeah, it, it's not our intent with the facility to uh, promote pedestrians crossing uh, mid-block without a dedicated crossing. Absolutely. All right. The next question is, are cars allowed to operate in any of the red BRT lanes? One of your animated flow videos showed cars flowing in the red lane. That's from Lubin. So in the curb only lanes, there are there is the allowance to have vehicles operate or right turning vehicles to operate in the um, close to intersections to turn right from the general purpose lanes and to turn right onto the side street. Uh, but again, VISM is a microscopic model, and if you sometimes they things end up being very aggressive and they jump in and out of, of lane positions as they choose at times to try to mimic the reality of 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 real traffic. Next question. Has there been any discussion of NCDOT and reimbursement of municipal funds regarding BRT systems? Have you seen any? I have not no, been no. a part of any of those kind of discussions. Is that a Tim or Eric, sorry? No, I haven't heard of that discussion either. One last question for you, Daniel. Are the concerns with TSP for buses in high pedestrian volume areas? Abby Williams is asking that question. Is that one of the ones that you posted in the chat? I'm just trying to reread it. Yeah, it's the last question, Daniel. Yeah, th there, there's an interesting contrast about the the functional benefits of TSP versus very good signal timing, and then how that contrasts with 
pedestrian timing. There are definitely challenges because when, when we when we time a corridor, typically the perpendicular crossing across a thoroughfare is going to be the highest pedestrian time, and therefore that will drive up the side street splits. So in in the only area where you can capture time for transit signal priority is off the side streets or main street lefts. So in high pedestrian areas, there is a limited benefit from transit signal priority because those ped areas basically actuate every time and the cycle length is driven to max. So you can't really steal time from an area that a pedestrian requires a maximum amount of time to cross the pavement. It's just the nature of our traffic engineering business and that and, and that's just a part of of this multimodal uh atmosphere that we are now a part of we have to make it all work together as seamlessly as possible yeah i think the moral of the story the reason eric and i picked the ones we did to talk about is hey look it's not easy yeah it's, <laughs> you can't fit all the things you have to you have to pick and choose and prioritize some things here and something else over there there is a baseline of safety we're trying to achieve, but it's not easy. Well said. So, Roger, uh, can I ask a question of the Capitol Boulevard team? Sure, yes. So, um, pretend I don't know anything about the project, but have you, have you figured <laughs> out yet, um, from an implementation strategy standpoint, are we gonna be better off breaking this down into smaller chunks or, or bigger pieces? John, you wanna take that or you want me to take it? Uh, Mike, why don't you take that one? Okay. So yes, Eric. So we we've already talked to Campo about spot uh, scoring for this and how that would work in spot scoring. We know that at one time, I believe this entire corridor was under one project or two projects. Um, we will be breaking it down into separate projects, either by interchange or length, um, and and by priority. Um, what that means is the ones that we think are going to be the the most needed first towards the towards the back. Now, obviously, they're all needed, um, but just looking at the places where there's the most combined volume in places. So, for instance, uh, the the one intersection right now with probably the highest combined volumes would be Oak Church Buffalo Road interchange. You know, the the expect expectation is that would probably go early on in the implementation process. Also, don't forget that DOT is doing a, is there is a tip project to upgrade the interchange at 440. So if that does happen earlier, if that if that project does happen on the earlier side, we would want to try and do that first as well to kind of connect to that to do one seamless project. Because we obviously we don't while we do want to split it into projects for financial purposes, we also don't want to have to do maintenance of traffic on Capitol Boulevard multiple times over a 20 year period. So it's a balance of everything. Um, that's going on, and then also is the the timing of BRT is also a question. So, so your 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 easy question has a complicated answer, um, but we have looked at that, we have split it into projects, and we have submitted those projects for spot funding through Campo as separate projects. Thank you. Thank you all. It looks like uh, we got through all the questions and I know we're running over time. So I wanted to uh, quickly remind, remind everybody of the annual meeting uh, networking event tonight from five to seven. Once again, I think I believe it is Claudio's where the uh, email came from. And also, there you go, Mike Sarasky's hyping it up. And so not to make it awkward for Stravi, who works for the wonderful WSP company, but here is their advertisement. And WSP was the sponsor of this session. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Stravi. Well, Mike, Mike's uh, trying to promote bingo during board business tomorrow. So if you all can join, that would be great. And thanks, Daniel, for the shout out. All right. There we go. Thank you all so much. Thanks for all the panelists and everybody that uh, hung in there through everything. So uh, everybody have a great rest of the day and hopefully we'll see you all this evening. Thanks, Josh. Thank Bye. Thank you, everyone.